All right, so we know some guys on Pitt's roster are playing very well this season. You've got your Eli Holstein, of course, your Kyle Lewis, your Desmond Reed, your Kanate Mumfield. There's some guys that are putting in some standout performances, playing really well. We've talked a lot about those guys and talked about how well they've played and how important they've been to Pitt's 4-0 start so far this season. But as the Panthers head into the ACC schedule, as they come out of their off week after the first third of the season, head into the final eight games, all conference games, starting with this weekend's trip to Chapel Hill, to face North Carolina in a place they have never won before, they're going to need a few more guys to step up. And in particular, there are going to be a few players who need to play better than they have so far this season. And wouldn't you know it, I've got five right here that we're going to talk about. Five guys, two on offense, three on defense, who need to take a big step forward for Pitt to have the kind of success they look like they might be capable of over the next eight games. Who are those five? Well... I guess we're going to talk about it right here on the Morning Pit, the Wednesday edition on YouTube.com slash PantheLawyer.com. <clears throat> yes, the Wednesday edition of the Morning Pit, YouTube.com slash PantheLawyer.com. I'm Chris Peak from PantheLawyer.com hanging out with you this morning talking about five pit players who need to step up, five pit players who need to take a step forward this season and really over the next eight games in order for Pitt to have the success that they look like they just might be capable of. It's interesting. I did a ACC power rankings yesterday on the message boards at pantheler.com. Just a little bit of a conversation starter here. Here's my thoughts on the conference. Here's how I rank them one through 17. What do you think? How do you rank them? And you know, back and forth. And there were a number of replies that said, you know, I think we're overhyping Pitt because this is what Pitt fans do. There's an inherent skepticism they have about their favorite team. Maybe all fan bases are like this. Um, but I don't know if all fan bases have the percentage of uh, skeptical fans that Pitt does. But either way, um, uh, plenty of uh, skepticism. Oh, they just barely beat two uh, not great Big 12 teams. And yeah, that, that's true, but they still beat them. Uh, oh, you shouldn't have Pitt ranked ahead of Louisville. To uh, which I say, why not? Louisville, yes, they lost at Notre Dame. That's more challenging than playing at Cincinnati or hosting West Virginia. But Pitt's still 4-0. And they beat two power conference teams. Louisville is three and one. They have lost to a power conference team and beat one. And the one they beat was Georgia Tech. Anyway, it doesn't matter about Pitt. It doesn't matter about Louisville. But there, there is like sort of skepticism about what Pitt is capable of over the next eight games, about what Pitt has accomplished so far through the first four games and what they're capable of over the next eight games. I think the upside to saying, oh, I'm not so sure that Pitt's all that good, we probably should settle down on all the hype, is that you could just keep saying it, and eventually they'll lose a game, and then you can say, see, I was right. Uh, of course, if they never lose a game, which is unlikely, but if they never lose a game, then I think at some point you have to say, well, maybe I wasn't right. But either way, Pitt is 4-0 and so far, and it's based on the strength of some really outstanding individual performances, which we've talked about a couple of times, you know, we ranked, I think last week we ranked the top five players on the team. I think we did that a couple, you know, a couple of weeks in a row. And certainly we've talked about it on the message boards. Eli Holstein's up on that list. Desmond Reed is up on that list. Kyle Lewis is up on that list. I think Kanate Mumfield is on that list. Donovan McMillan has played well. Brandon George has played well. Rasheem Biles is definitely on that list. Uh, we had a funny exchange with, with Rasheem Biles yesterday said, uh, you know, did, did, you, did you come into the season with some goals? Did you write down goals, tackles for loss, sacks, that kind of thing? And he said, yeah, I, I had some goals that I wrote down, but I had, I, had to, I had to change them because I already beat some of those numbers. So, you know, he, I think he said his goal was like three sacks and he already has three. So he's had to adjust a few of his stats. So Rasheem Biles, definitely in that group of individual players who have stepped up and played really well for Pitt to get them to 4-0. and But there's some other guys that are going to need – to do more. There's some other guys that Pitt is going to need some step up performances out of. Guys who I don't think have necessarily contributed at the highest of their capacity, you know, highest of their capabilities just quite yet. So I thought we could talk about that today. Five guys, five guys I'm going to be keeping an eye on to see if they can step up and perform at a higher level over the next eight games starting this Saturday at North Carolina. And one guy is a guy I've talked about. I wonder if I've talked about him more than any other player on the team over the last four years. I don't know. I This might be the, the one player who has been mentioned more on this 
podcast, any anything I do, you know what I mean, whether it's the live shows or since we started doing the Morning Pit two years ago, probably the player I've talked about more than anybody else, other than maybe Bengali Kamara. <laughs> and though, though Kamara was only for like two years. We've been talking for the last four years pretty steadily about Gavin Bartholomew. And here we are in a season where Pitt's offense is thoroughly taking off. It's the most exciting Pitt offense that we've seen since Bartholomew's freshman year in 2021. And Gavin doesn't seem to be reaping the rewards of this offensive outburst. So far through four games, he's got 12 receptions for 113 yards, no touchdowns, less than 10 yards per reception. His per catch average of 9.4 yards is lower than the per reception averages of Kanate Mumfield, Kenny Johnson, Raphael Williams, Desmond Reed, Sensir Lee, and Jake Overman. Not to mention Dejon Reynolds and Che Wabuko and Zion Fowler L, who all have better than you know 9.4 yards per catch on just one catch. Reynolds has a, a you know one catch for 40 yards. Wabuko has one catch for 13. Fowler L one catch for 12. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily expect Gavin Bartholomew to be a guy who pours it on in terms of yards per reception. I don't expect him to be a big yak guy. Um, oh, you know, his his yak per reception this year, 6.8 yards after the catch, is right in line with what he did the last two years, 6.7 in 2023, 6.3 in 2022. His freshman year, he had a, a, a yak per reception of more than 10 yards, but that's because his you know, average depth of target was literally less than two. Now, we've talked a lot over the last couple of years about how Gavin Bartholomew's usage changed from the Mark Whipple season to the Frank Signetti years, how that average depth of target that I just mentioned under Mark Whipple in 2021 was 1.8 yards, uh, largely because Bartholomew was lining up in the backfield and he was going out in the flat. And he wasn't getting very far past the line of scrimmage, but he was getting more than 10 yards after the catch per reception. What happened in the next two years is his average depth of target went up eight yards in 2022, Signetti's first year, more than 11 yards downfield in 2023, Signetti's second year. So you end up with Bartholomew not care, catching nearly as high a percentage of his targets, getting a little bit more targets. Well, in 2022, he did targets per game that went up a little bit in 22 and 23 from what it was when Bartholomew was a freshman. But he's not turning it into as much. He scored fewer touchdowns in the last two years than he did as a freshman. His receiving yardage was it never surpassed what it was as a freshman. He had the same receiving yardage his freshman year as his junior year, and he had less in his uh, sophomore year in 2022. So those numbers never went up, even though he was being targeted more downfield because it's not necessarily his game. This year, his average depth of target is less than four yards downfield 3.6 to be exact and you're also seeing his usage uh as very different from what it was in the past the last two years with Signetti he was in line most of the time 63 percent of his snaps were in line um I mean 63 percent of his passing snaps were in line uh almost 80 percent in 2000 63 uh, percent last year almost 80 percent two years ago this year that number of in line passing snaps is down to 44 percent uh meanwhile he's lining up wide on pass plays 27 percent of the time which is a career high you're seeing him you know he's also in the slot 28 percent of the time which is a little bit less actually than last year um but still higher, you know, they're, they're working him outside more. He hasn't been in the backfield as much. Remember his freshman year, he was in the backfield a ton. This year, according to Pro Football Focus, he's only taken one snap out of the backfield, whereas, like I say, his freshman year, he was in the backfield all the time. But you're seeing a different kind of usage for Gavin Bartholomew, and we thought it would translate to greater production. Now, if you take his numbers so far, 12 catches for 106 yards. Uh, you know, if you after four games, you project them out over a 12 game schedule and you end up with career highs. You know, 36 receptions. That'd be more than any other year he's had um, at Pitt. He ended up with 318 yards, which is a little shy of his career high, but the receptions would be a career high. His targets, he's been targeted 16 times in four games. Project that over 12 games, that's 48 targets. That would be a career high. So he's seeing the ball more. However, of his 16 targets, 10 were in the first two games. The last two games, West Virginia and Youngstown State, he's gotten three targets in each of those games. So either they're holding back on a potential weapon 
in Gavin Bartholomew trying to hold out and, and wait as long as possible before unleashing him, or he's just not getting featured in this offense. Now, at various points over the years, and this dates back to like 2009 is when I remember really embracing this this concept. Because back in 2009, people would would ask, oh, why aren't they getting the ball to Henry Hynoski more? Why aren't they getting the ball to Nate Byam more? Why These guys need to get involved. They need to get the ball more. And I would always say like, look, yeah, Henry, great player. You know, Nate Byam, great player. Or Bynum, as it were. Great players. But if you had the option of giving the ball to Henry Hynoski and Nate Byam or Doran Dickerson, Jonathan Baldwin, and Dion Lewis, who are you choosing? Right? Who are you choosing? And it's no disrespect to Hynoski and Byam, but the fact is Baldwin, Dickerson, and Lewis were more explosive, could make big plays, and had a chance to give you a touchdown, you know, more often than not, you know, within reasonable distance. I mean, they weren't scoring touchdowns more often than not, but you had a greater, a, a much higher likelihood of those guys scoring touchdowns than you had with Hynoski and Bayam. And so, I, you know, I've embraced that concept before. And if you want to sit down and say, all right, Chris, you, you want to get the ball to El Barto, great. Who are you taking touches away from? Desmond Reed, Kanate Mumfield, Kenny Johnson, Poppy Williams, CJ Lee. Like, who are you taking touches away from to give them to Gavin Bartholomew? And I totally get that. I, again, I've been embracing that line of thinking for a long time. We, we get enamored with individual players, certain guys like Hynoski and Byam or El Barto. We want to get them the ball because it's it's Hammer and Hank. You know, it's Nate Bynum out of Franklin. It's, it's El Barto. We want to get those guys the ball when there are more explosive, more dynamic playmakers on the field. And so I'm wary of that. And, and, and I'm, I'm trying to be cognizant of not falling into that hole. However, I talked yesterday about those third down issues. Five of 19 on third down against Cincinnati and West Virginia. Now, Kanate Mumfield can make plays for you on third down. Kenny Johnson can too. Raphael Williams, I think, can. Sincere Lee can. I think Gavin Bartholomew can make plays for you on third down. He's been targeted twice on third down this season. He's caught one pass and he caught it for like three yards. I think when you get yourself into manageable down and distance situations, everybody has to watch number nine. They have to watch number two. They got to watch zero coming out of the backfield. They got to watch number five. Number 11 just scored an 82-yard touchdown against uh, Youngstown State. Shoot, number three had a 40-yard touchdown, right? Lots of guys to keep an eye on. Lots of guys to watch. Lots of guys that you've got to pay attention to. Now, I think there are, because there are so many weapons who command so much attention, arguably more weapons than they had in 2009, I think there are opportunities there for 86 to get involved. Like they're just not throwing the ball to him much. They need to 86 that idea. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I I think he needs to be more involved, not taking the place of, of Reed Mumfield Johnson or Williams but in, comp- in, in you know, complimentary work with those guys. I think there are opportunities there. I mean, you look at how Cincinnati got their tight end involved against Pitt in, in that game in week two. I think you can find things that Gavin Bartholomew can do like that. And especially when you're running him out of the slot. You know, you're running him out wide. You're going to get matchups that you should be able to take advantage of. And again, like he doesn't need to lead the team in targets. There shouldn't be a game where he does lead the, game, the team in targets. But he should be one of your best and most reliable weapons on third down. And that's the thing that we haven't really seen. Uh, you know, I think he could help them in that regard. All right, I spent a lot of time talking about it, Gavin Bartholomew. I, I just don't think he's been utilized to his fullest uh, capabilities yet. And, and I think he's got more he can give this team. I'll tell you the other guy on offense that I, I think needs to take a step forward. And, and I say this thinking that I, you know, that I believe, knowing full well that I believe he's, if he's not one of the best offensive linemen on the team, he might have the highest ceiling of any offensive lineman on this team. And it's Ryan Bear. Um, now, Ryan Bear, I'll say this. Jeremy Darvo, the offensive line coach, told us yesterday he thinks Ryan Bear leads the team in pancakes. And so there's no questioning his, questioning his physicality. There's no questioning how he gets after it. There's no questioning his, his drive and his energy and you know all of that. Okay, But according to Pro Football Focus, he's given up more pressures than any other player on Pitt's uh, offense. And... He's actually given up more pressures than any other player in the ACC. 
According to Pro Football Focus, he has allowed 16 pressures in four games. Now, we can say what we want about Pro Football Focus's numbers, but they're judging a pressure however they're judging it. And assuming they're judging it all on the same scale, scale, assuming they're judging it all on the same scale, Bear is at that top of that list and not in the way you want to be. He's got the biggest number. Um, I think Ryan Bear can be really good. I think Ryan Bear could be an NFL offensive lineman, but there has been pressure coming off the right side. You know, and, and teams aren't blitzing that much. According to Pro Football Focus, uh, Eli Holstein's been blitzed on about 26% of his dropbacks. It's not that much, right? Like, you're getting a lot of four-man rush, one-on-ones, nothing too crazy, maybe some twists and things like that, but the kind of thing you should be able to pick up if you are a future off- NFL offensive lineman, which I believe Ryan Bear is. Now, it's just, you know, first full season as a starter, he's still young, but at, at some point here, he's going to have to take that step forward or multiple steps forward. And if it could be this Saturday at North Carolina, that would be good. Maybe UNC might get their top uh, pass rushing defensive end back, in which case guys like Bear and Branson Taylor are going to have their hands full potentially. Uh, but Bear needs to, to take a step forward. I think he needs to be better than he has been so far. One interesting note is I was looking up the players in the uh, ACC who have given up the most pressures. Bear is number one. Number two is North Carolina tackle Trevion Green. And number four, tied for third actually in pressures allowed, is North Carolina's other tackle, Howard Sampson. So maybe an opportunity there for Pitt's pass rush to have a little success given that um, Green and Sampson – uh, the two North Carolina tackles uh, are right up there giving up some of the most pressures in the conference. So I thought that was interesting and maybe something to keep an eye on. All right, flipping over to defense. And um, you won't be surprised in the least where I go with this, uh, certainly in terms of position, uh, but just in terms of focus on where, you know, what players need to step up, what areas of the field they need an improvement. I mean, because you know what I think about the linebackers. Uh, you know that I think the corners have been fine and I actually think they've improved game to game. I think the safeties have been good. Uh, you know, I expect them to get better and make more splash plays, but they've done pretty well. They've got a couple interceptions already. Three interceptions. Does PJ O'Brien have a pick too? I'm drawing a blank on that. I know, uh, McMillan and, uh, Cruz Brookins have interceptions. No, PJ O'Brien does not have an interception. McMillan's got one. Brookins has one. Tamarian Crumpley has one, and then uh, Kyle Lewis has two. So that's the five interceptions for Pitt through four games. But I think those guys have been fine. I think the back seven has been fine, uh, and in some cases, exceptional. Obviously, it's up front. And I think even more specific than that, uh, you know, we will put a fine point upon it, the defensive tackles. And I would single out three guys in particular that I think need to take a big step forward. I'm a, I have higher expectations for these three guys. And it's Nick James, it's Nikai Johnson, it's an, and it's Isaiah Neal. Now, each of those three guys has a different situation. They're each unique. And, and I think there are different expectations you have for each guy. But on the whole, I think you need them all to be doing more than they have been. Um, you know, James has five tackles and .5 tackles for loss. Uh, Nikai Johnson has 11 tackles this season and one tackle for loss. And Isaiah Neal has eight tackles this season, one tackle for loss and 0.5 sacks, which is the entirety of the sack production from the defensive tackle position for Pitt so far this season. In terms of pressures, according to Pro Football Focus, Nikai Johnson has recorded four in four games. James and Neal have recorded two each. You, you, you have to get more. It might not be the biggest playmaking position. I understand we've all been spoiled around here watching uh, Aaron Donald and Jalen Twyman and Kalijah Kansi. These playmaking defensive tackles will get in the backfield all the time and get 10 sacks or 12 sacks or whatever it is, eight sacks. Like, I know that's atypical. I know that's not what you can expect out of most defensive tackles. I know those are exceptional players, and in some cases, or at least one case, generational talents. There's two first-round draft picks that we're talking about in there. That's not what you normally get from the defensive tackles, and I get that. But you need more than this. You need more than one tackle for loss from, you know... I mean, these three guys combined have two and a half tackles for loss through four games. It's got to it's got to be better than that. Now, James transferred in. He's he's an upperclassman. He's got some experience, not a ton, 
and, and he got hurt in the Youngstown State game, so you see what happens there. Johnson just moved from defensive end to defensive tackle last, you know, last late last fall, really through the offseason. So maybe that transition's still taking place. Neil is a redshirt freshman. He he's playing college football for the first time. These are the first four games of his college football career. Like, so I, I get that with all of those guys. And 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 I understand that. You know what I mean? I, I, I think you adjust your expectations accordingly. But it's, you know, the fifth game of the season coming up now. And you finish this, you'll be playing the game that represents the halfway point of the season. So, like, how long can you wait before those transitions are made? And it's not like you have an option. It's not like you have some alternative. It's not like you're going to uh, not play those guys and you're going to get, you know, Anthony Johnson's hurt. Sean Fitzsimmons, who knows when he'll be back. Pat Narduzzi said it seems like he's headed back this week, but we'll see. Uh, you know, Elliot Donald still isn't really producing much. Uh, like, like these are the guys you're going to roll with. You're going to have James out there. You're going to have Johnson. You're going to have uh, Neil. And then ideally you'll get Fitzsimmons back into that mix. And it'd be great if Anthony Johnson could come back at some point, but we'll see there. But these are going to be your main guys, James, Johnson, Neil, and they have to produce. They have to take a step forward. And I'm not saying they have to go out and get four sacks at North Carolina, but a couple plays in the backfield, particularly against Omari and Hampton, and, and if you can get to Jacoby Criswell, that'd be great. Like, you need that out of that position. You know, and Nate Matlack, this isn't letting Nate Matlack and Jimmy Scott and Sincere Edwards and Chief Borders off the uh, off the hook because they're not, although I think Matlack's producing at a fine level. I think Edwards is a true freshman, so he'll keep growing and evolving. He'll have some splash plays. Uh, and I think Scott has been solid. But I just think those three guys in the interior need to take a big step forward. Uh, I really think they do. Uh, I think they need to get more sound against the run, and I think they need to be able to attack more. They need to be more aggressive and, and successful in their aggressive attacks. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of potential there for all those guys. I think Nick James looks like he's got a pretty high ceiling. I know when Nikai Johnson made the move from defensive end to defensive tackle, there was a lot of excitement in the building in the south side about the potential he was showing about how good he could be and how it seemed like he finally found a natural home. And look, I think Isaiah Neal is going to be a stud. They just need all these things to happen faster. They need all these things to happen in a hurry. They need all those things to happen. If not right now, then like three days from now, <laughs> they need those guys to play at a higher level than they have been. So Gavin Bartholomew, Ryan Bear, Nick James, Nikai Johnson, Isaiah Neal, we need to see more out of you starting this weekend. And, and not everybody's going to become an all-conference player overnight, but I think you need to start seeing some signs as you get into the ACC schedule, you come into the second two-thirds of the season, you need to start seeing a little more out of these guys who, who, are, who you're counting on to do a lot. And you got a lot out of some guys that you've been counting on. Like I mentioned, Holstein, Reed, Mumfield, Johnson, Williams, uh, you know, Lewis, Biles, all, all these guys. You're getting a lot out of these guys. But you got a few other spots that need to step up and take a step forward, and we'll see what they're able to do this Saturday. Don't forget, tonight we've got our live Panther Lair show. It's 8.30 p.m. Me and Jim Hammett get together and talk pit sports with you for an hour. Can't wait. Looking forward to that. It's always a lot of fun doing the live show, and hopefully you'll get a chance to join us right here at youtube.com slash pantherlair.com. If you want to make sure you don't miss it, like this video and subscribe to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash pantherlair.com so you can get all of our pit video content. And of course, check out the website, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. I make so many references to the conversations we're having at pantherlair.com. You should go hang out on the message boards and see what those conversations are like. So come hang out, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. All right. We will see you tonight at the live show. Don't forget, 8.30 p.m. And then uh, we'll be back at it with another morning pit tomorrow. So enjoy your Wednesday. We'll catch up with you tomorrow morning. We'll catch up with you tonight and then tomorrow morning right here at youtube.com slash